All right, so we're going to talk about retrospectives. I know everybody here probably already knows a lot about retrospectives and the value that they bring to the team. I want to talk about how we spread that out across the whole organization. Um, I am the founder of Scatterspoke, which my husband and I built as a, you know, initially just a very simple retrospective tool for teams that were distributed. Um, it's grown over the last couple of years and turned into like a real actual product and a tool. And it's fun being on that side of product development, all those things that we coach our teams to do. Um, they're really hard when it's your own product. <laughs> it turns out small batch size and frequent deliveries and gathering feedback. Those are all, those are all hard practices to put into place. So it's fun to be on that side of development for a little, for a little while. Um, I'm also CEO of ProConban.org. I see a lot of familiar faces from our amazing Kanban community here. Um, I've been really active in Colorado's Agile scene through Agile Denver and the Mile High Agile Conference and then nationally through the Agile Uprising. Um, my most important job is to these three that you see who look so tiny in this picture already. They are 3, 11, and 13 and really keep me on my toes these days. <laughs> so let's talk about our retros. So what, um, what really piqued my interest in understanding how we could scale retros and collect feedback across an organization was this quote that came from a client I was working with. And um, we had a meeting where at the end of every sprint, all the scrub masters would come together and do a quick recap. We weren't bringing um, the, the actual feedback that the, you know, the actual cards are stickies, but we were just getting together to talk about um, what themes were coming out of our retros. And um, the CIO at this company said, I had no, I mean, no idea how many teams were struggling with the exact same problem. And I had a little bit of a light bulb moment, right? All of a sudden it was like, we're sitting on all this amazing data that's coming out of the teams that the teams are collecting on a regular basis. And it often doesn't go anywhere. We don't do anything with it. Um, so what we wanted to figure out was how do we start to take all of this feedback that we're collecting from our teams in these really amazing retrospectives and connect the dots um, so that we can, can really start to drive out big change and, and, and sometimes even the problems that are affecting the whole organization. So let's start at this most simplest piece here. What is our retrospective? Our retrospectives are um, a regular opportunity for us to gather feedback from our team about our products, our processes, our performance, how we're interacting and how we're delivering value as a way to identify opportunities for improvement. I bet everybody here has been in at least one. Um, I always like to joke that sometimes these tend to be very um, focused, especially when we were in the office on food, snacks, <laughs> um, meals for the team. Um, but what we really wanna get to when we talk about our retros is um, how we work together. Um, when we think about why, we're, why we have a retrospective, we're trying to really get the team to own their process. Um, you know, it's always interesting. Whenever I start a big transformation project, I always try to make sure that everybody understands while we might be on the same page when we start, with scrum practices, with Kanban practices, with a blend of those practices, every team will start to create their own path of how they're using these tools through their retrospectives. So we might all start with the same recipe. I heard Jason use a recipe analogy in the last talk too. Um, we might start with our own recipe, but everybody's gonna end up with a slightly different flavor of how things are working. And we do that through our retros. So we're constantly looking at what's working for us, what's not working for us, and what are the small tweaks we can make over time. Um, I tend to give teams a lot of autonomy here with their retros because I want them to feel that ownership over their process so that they're building something that really works for them and fits for the needs of their team. So let's think about this in terms of levels of the organization. Um, I think for most organizations, you probably have at least three of these, and we're going to refer to the ones in the middle as the system, but we have our team level retros, right? We have system level retros, and these could be things like a program retro, a portfolio retro. If you're in an organization that's using scaled agile framework, these can be things like um, your inspect and adapt workshop as part of PI planning. And then in some cases, we have an opportunity to do retros at the organization level. Um, you can either raise your hand physically or use the reaction button in Zoom. I want a quick peek here. Who has had a retro across an entire org? Has anybody participated in one or hosted one? I see Marcus. 
I see lots of no's, more no's than, oh, Adele, she's got a thumbs up. Not enough, right? I see more no's than yeses, that's for sure. Um, and that's kind of a bummer, right? A lot of times the way we get feedback at the organization level is through like an HR survey that comes out once a year. Um, so we'll circle back and talk about how do we start to use what we know about what makes great retros at a team level to help an organization have a retrospective as well. So let's start with the team. When we think about the team level, right, this is an insulated group inside of a larger, a larger system. So when we think just about the team, we're looking for what different things about how we work together can help us drive change. And these are often small things, right? You've probably heard before, we wanna pick one or two things out of our retrospective to try to change. We don't wanna introduce a bunch of big changes. These are small, um, almost micro level improvements that we're, that we're making so that we can try something new, see how it's working um, and come back to the team. From a team perspective, I like to look at these as um, almost a, a hypothesis, right? If we change this thing, we expect it to do, to do what for how we're delivering, right? And then that gives you a basis for measuring and, and coming back to that to see if it, if it gave you the intended results. There's kind of two types of feedback we like to think about, right? We have our qualitative feedback and our quantitative feedback. I have a, a great friend who became a scrum master a couple of years ago. And one of the first things she said to me was, um, is it normal for people to cry in a retro? And I said, it, it can be, it sure can be. I've seen, I've seen that, I've seen yelling, I've seen people storm out. Um, there can be a lot of emotion in this. We spend so much of our life at work um, and we can be very attached to what we're delivering. I think it's very natural for this to be um, a place where, where the team can get kind of raw together. And that's, you know, that requires a lot of trust and safety um, and can take time for the team to build up that kind of relationship where they feel like they can be that transparent. Um, but it's a great thing, right? To have the team really talk through how they're feeling about their workload, their communication with each other, um, the systems that they've got in place to deliver and how that's working for them. What's equally as important though, is that we have quantitative feedback. And so when we think about that quantitative feedback, we wanna look at the same simple metrics at every retrospective. I'm obviously a big fan of the flow metrics, right? So I like to look at cycle time, work in progress and throughput at every retro and look at the trends since the last retrospective to tell me, are we going up? Are we going down? How does this look over time? And then that's also helping us connect that qualitative feedback to the quantitative feedback. So we're able to say, it seems like our cycle time went down this last sprint, but it also looks like maybe we, we had um, an outage that pulled a couple people away from the work that they had. So they had to um, shift off work to something that was more urgent. And so we're able to start to see those things side by side. Being able to look at these together, I think is really important. In retrospectives, a lot of the feedback we get can be very subjective, right? So it can be things like, I think we got too, we have too much work or we're, we're slowing down. Um, so connecting the data to our feelings can really help, help us ground in what's actually happening. Um, I'm also a fan of just telling the team, like somebody pull up a calendar and tell me what kind of stuff was on your calendar for the last two weeks, right? That's always a good indication of what was also happening over the course of a sprint or in between two retros. So the downside of all of this is that you can really optimize the hell out of one team at the expense of other teams in your organization, right? Um, and we all as coaches and scrum masters, we want to make our teams awesome. We want to make our teams great and help them deliver. But sometimes those optimizations can be at the expense of another team. I see this a lot more with like support teams. So um, teams like DevOps, teams like security um, API type teams, right? We might have a product development team that's really working to try to make sure that everything is out of their way and clear for delivery, but it's really slowing down these other teams who support their work. So what we want to think about here when we're looking at how teams work together is system level feedback. And that system feedback is going to be the network of teams, right? And that can be at a program level, a portfolio level, but we're going to start to look at dependencies and coordination across multiple teams. So how are all of these teams working together? The first thing that's going to be important in these retros is to connect the dots. So 
Um, what I see a lot for these, these kind of retros, right, is, um, does anybody do any kind of retro report? Any hands up for that? I've seen a few in Confluence where the teams do a report um, and that data gets collected and pulled into a, a inspect and adapt workshop. Um, but we wanna be able to identify themes and patterns from the team so that we can say like, it seems like this team's struggling with the same team this team is struggling with, or it seems like this blocker for this team is impacting five other teams, right? So we wanna start to connect those dots so we can really zero in on what needs um, improvement or what needs cleared for all of the teams together. The other piece that's really important here, and, and actually I think a fairly easy pattern to break is that we tend to do system level retros or PI, you know, inspect and adapt workshops. They tend to be very disconnect driven. And what I mean by that is we do these like once a quarter, right? So maybe we get four of them a year for lucky. Um, and so maybe you're, you're getting all the teams together and saying what's working, what's working right now, what's not working right now. Um, but what happens is that's a snapshot in time, right? Over a three month period where maybe the first month was really rocky and the second month was really good. And the third month is really rocky again. And all I'm gonna remember is that we had a really bad deployment, right? I'm not gonna remember the stuff that went well three months ago. So what we wanna do is both of these practices together, right? How do we connect the dots, but how do we also gather data all the time? I like to make sure that we're not bringing new data just to those system level retros, but that we're collecting all of that information over the course of all the team level retros and using that to help drive this conversation. The other piece that's great about this is these are expensive meetings. Like, let's be honest, systems level retro with um, multiple teams together and leadership involved, um, that's an expensive retrospective to have. You don't wanna spend your time together trying to remember what happened. So the more information you can come to this meeting with and come to this retro with, um, you're gonna be able to focus more on what actions you wanna drive instead of trying to gather, gather all new data when you've already collected all of this from the teams. So what we're trying to do here is bring together a combination of priority and transparency. So um, priority meaning what is impacting the most teams? How do we drive some action around that? And then the transparency around how are we doing? Um, you know, think of this if your organization uses anything like OKRs or any kind of um, you know, framework around goals and how we're gonna get to those goals. We want to do the same thing with the actions that come out of a retro at this level. So what are the things the organization is working on? Um, how do we, what changes are we trying to drive and how are we doing on fixing these things? What tends to happen, and we hear this at the team level too, is we have our team level retro, we identify a couple action items and we come back in two weeks and we start that whole process over. And maybe three or four retros ago, we said we were gonna focus on um, improving our test automation. And everybody said, yeah, we should, we should definitely do that. But then we stopped talking about it, right? And so from a transparency perspective, we wanna try to make sure that we're tracking our outcomes and our actions from these retros on an ongoing basis. Um, if you are introducing system level retros, I think a great way to do this is to fold this back into your team level retrospective. So that gives your teams an opportunity to say, you know, as, an, as, a, as a program or as a portfolio, we said we wanna focus on our test automation. For us, that means that at least one story every sprint should be something that based on improving test automation, right? And then you've connected that to an action that the team is gonna take to try to help drive that change out for the organization or the system. Let's go one more level up here. So our next level after the system is gonna be the organization. So I think we saw two or three hands for folks that said that they had been part of an organization-wide retrospective. And um, one of the things that's so interesting is I think it's probably the easiest practice that we have at the team level to spread across an org, right? We see a lot of organizations who are going through, like I mentioned, um, surveys or they're doing you know, employee MPS scores. Um, or team mood to try to figure out how the teams are doing. But what's crazy is we already have this practice um, and have great ways of gathering this data for each of the teams um, on an ongoing basis. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of unfortunate around um, 
organization-wide retros is they, they're so infrequent, right? So how do we drive some more frequency around getting feedback across the org? I think the first thing for these, like I said, is cadence, right? Getting them on the calendar, making this more of a culture of giving feedback and having an opportunity to participate in these conversations across the org. Um, you know, I think from an engineering perspective or an IT perspective, we tend to be very well versed in how this practice works of reflecting, identifying opportunities to improve and coming up with change. Um, but there's a lot of other parts of your business that might not have that opportunity and would be really excited to offer up their thoughts and feedback as well. Um, I think that this can be a great way too to connect the dots more globally, right? So look at how is a big system are we all going to drive change, right? We tend to, just like we talked about for local, you know, local optimization, how do we understand the impacts that one team has on another part of the business? Um, I think one place we see this a lot from an engineering perspective is maybe the relationship between engineering and marketing. That can be a little strained, especially if we're a very gate-driven organization. Um, so that's a great opportunity to make sure you're getting folks in from customer-facing roles, from engineering, from marketing, from sales, and have a retro that spans all of these different groups in one place. I've talked a lot about fixing problems. It's just as important that we celebrate successes as an org and not as a team too. I think that this is a great way, you know, to say, here's all the things we did or that we maybe changed about how we were working to try to deliver, um, you know, more seamlessly from end to end. So this is all moving us more from that local optimization to global optimization. What we want to look at here um, how do we organize around these improvements that maybe take more coordination to address? Um, there's a retro format I've run before where you actually take all of the possible improvements and you sort them into what's inside of our control and outside of our control. Has anybody done that retro format? And I did it one time and it was actually, it ended up kind of depressing the entire, like the entire board of sticky notes all ended up in things that the team felt like were outside their control to fix. But what's interesting about that, right? If we come back to that quote of, um, I had no idea how many teams were struggling with the same thing is um, maybe we just need to make sure that we're connecting those dots and giving everybody an, a chance to address those things that are outside the team's control. So who do we need? Who's, who needs to be part of this conversation? Um, and what would look different in our organization if everyone was contributing towards those improvements together? This probably sounds a little bit like systems thinking, right? So how are we all connected and how do we approach retrospectives with that systems thinking lens so that we're looking at how all of these parts work together instead of trying to make one team better at the expense of another. So how do we do this? I think you need two things for successful scaled retros. You need frequency and you need volume. So let's go back to our org chart here. So if we have all these teams in the bottom row, right? I've got the teams that group together to make a program and these two programs make one portfolio in this org and all of these roll up to the organization level. What do we need to get good, great feedback and even better improvements all the way across this organization? So let's start with feedback. So think of the, the feedback frequency as the rate at which feedback is provided. This is probably a pretty easy thing to answer for your teams. I would say most teams think of this, these, the waves across the bottom and how close they are together. That's your frequency, right? At the team level, this is happening probably every two weeks for your teams. Is that fair to say for most teams, we're doing retros every two weeks or maybe once a month. Um, but as you move up in the organization, as we talked about, um, your org level retros are probably way less infrequent. We're getting people together there, not very often, right? It's expensive, it's hard to coordinate, it takes a lot of time. So how do we make it easier to have more frequency in our feedback? Um, I think the first thing is make it easy to collect data. Whatever this looks like for your org, the more data you have, the more opportunity you have to zero in on these improvements. Um, you can dump cards into a Google sheet, you could create um, 
you know, different data setups where you can collect all of this data from the teams anonymously. I've also done uh, a running Google sheet with all the scrum masters where they put in themes into columns. So it's just like, here's some key themes that came out and there's no teams attached to it. Um, it's not the actual feedback text, but what we're trying to do is get enough data that we can start to say, what patterns do we see and how do we identify them on a regular basis? A lot of times, um, when we start to collect data, there's there can be a little bit of fear in this. And I think we have to be careful to make sure that we're protecting the safety of the team and not exposing their feedback directly, but working with the team to identify what things need to be raised up or escalated in a retrospective that's at a higher level so that you can get the right attention to get action. So like I said, at the bottom, we're probably looking at every two weeks. I think in your system level retro, Monthly is a great cadence. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of quarterly <laughs> retros at that level because I think that's not enough, right? I mean, when we think about all the coordination and um, think about this just like you would, how long would you be willing to be blocked or have your team blocked by another team who may not know they're blocking you? Um, a quarter is a long time to wait to address some of those things. I think monthly can be a great cadence here, even um, every four weeks, um, so that you're doing every other sprint to have a system level retro. And then if you've got an org with an appetite for it, I think quarterly is a great cadence for your business, right? Across the whole organization, how do we get people involved at a quarterly level to start to do a retro and talk through how things are working for everybody? The other piece we talked about here for success is volume. And what I mean by volume is just how far is that feedback going? How, how quickly is it moving up through the organization and reaching the right people? So when we think about the volume of our feedback, where does yours start to lose volume? And so think of this, you know, at the team level, you may have the audience of the team and the scrum master, maybe an engineering manager who's interested in what kind of um, issues is the team running into and how are we addressing them? But if you have somebody um, in a portfolio, maybe a program manager um, who is running coordination across multiple teams, do they know what the teams are struggling with enough to, to help drive action on them? So you wanna look at where, where are we losing the volume here? Don't let your retro become the black box, right? The airplane black box. We wanna make sure that um, we're driving action on these things. And if we take all of that feedback from the team and stuff it away and never do anything with it, um, the teams get burned out, right? They start to say, you know, that there's no value in the retrospective process because they're not getting any action out of it. Um, I think another easy way, if your teams are struggling with making um, time or space for retros is to make sure that your retros are part of a bigger planning cycle. So if you're doing things like big room planning, and, and an inspect and adapt workshop can be part of that. Or if you're doing any kind of um, cross team planning where you've got multiple teams together, use that as an opportunity to add an element of that system level retro here. You wanna make sure that there's an easy opportunity, right? To, to make sure we're connecting these dots, um, not just across, but also up inside the organization too. And then make sure that you're taking action. So who are the right people? Who are the people that need to get this information so that we can drive some action with it? So think about your team level stays at the team, right? So we just want that to be the team driving the action there. Um, maybe the next level up for system, you're looking at different leadership in the organization that needs to be part of that conversation and probably cross team or cross portfolio or program. And then at the top, can you get your C-suite involved in a retrospective? Um, you know, I think you, you often hear leadership say that they're so surprised by things that come out of surveys, right? We're trying to avoid um, your retro being a soapbox event where everybody feels like it's their opportunity to scream the loudest about the things they hate and make this a really productive conversation where it's a snapshot, um, a long running snapshot of how the teams have been working over the course of their time together. So don't let this be you. Make sure that you know how many teams are maybe running into the same issue so that you can drive some action on it and that you have an opportunity to fix the things where your teams are getting stuck. That's everything I've got for you guys. I think we're gonna open it up for some questions via the chat or you can unmute if you'd like to unmute and ask a question. Got a question. Thank you, first of all. Yeah. 
Um, so there is an area between I can control and I cannot control your influence. I can influence, right? Yeah. So do we have any suggestion about how to make sure that the more frequent focused uh, retrospectives actually are, are related, have influence and can action a bit more? So that would be efficient, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think when we think about the influence, I think the making so I, there's kind of two parts of that. I really like that um, hypothesis format so that when you pick pick your action item, if you can say why and what you think will change. So let's say if a team told me we want to increase our whip, we want to increase our work in progress amount um, so that it's two two per person. My question to them would be how, what, why, like, why do we feel like that's a desired change and what do we think the result will be? And then that way, when we come back together, if they were to tell me, you know, it feels like we're always blocked on something and that will give us, we think that that will, we'll get more done if we have more in progress. Um, that gives me an opportunity to say, then that's the thing we want to measure, right? If there's a tendency, I think, with our, our action items to be very binary, and it's like a checkbox. So in that example, it would be like, did we, we said we wanted to increase our whip limits. Did we increase our whip limits? Everyone's like, yeah, and we're like, cool, we're done. But why were we doing that? And so if we can bring it back to like, what did you think would change? If you think we would, if the answer was we would get more through our system, now when we come back to retro again, the question can be, it looks like we increased our whip limits. Did we get more done like we thought we would by making that change? And if not, then let's talk about why, right? And so I think there's a, a loop there, right, of what data to collect to tell you if your improvements are working. And then bringing some visibility into that, I think, is important too. It's, um, you know, it's like I've seen teams put their retro, their retro action items when we were in an office next to where they were doing stand up. So it's present for everyone. Um, I think dumping them into Slack or Teams or something like that so that you've got them present on a regular basis. Um, you know, sometimes the, the hardest part of all of all of your improvements are the people side. <laughs> it's hard to change behavior. Um, so whatever you can do to keep them relevant and top of mind so they don't get lost, I think can be really helpful. Thank you, Colleen. Um, I have another. I have a question too. Um, from experience, teams tend to have retros on the team level, which go up to the team horizon. And if you want to stack the outcomes of various uh, team uh, retros, uh, they well, they are not stackable so well because they use different formats. There is different data. How do you deal with this problem in practice? Yeah, and I, I definitely I don't want to. Um... I think that's a good call out, Marcus. I don't, I, my intent is never to say that they have to be the same, right? I think that that letting the teams find their, find their flavor that fits them the best is really important. Um, I like to just pull up key themes and have whoever's facilitating those retros identify um, key themes or areas for escalation. And I always ask the team. So if something comes up in a retro and it's like, we were blocked by the security team on this issue that, you know, delayed our sprint delivery. Um, my first question would be, can I can I promote this up to the security team? And can we bring this into our next system retro? So that I'm first of all asking the team for permission, but then I'm also identifying what the thing is I'm gonna promote or escalate, right? Because I think there can be a little bit, if, if it feels like everything that gets mentioned in the retro gets escalated, then there, I think there can be fear of overreaction too. Um, so I don't think the retros need to be the same format, but it's more about making that pattern and making that um, conversation around what issues need to be promoted and then bringing those into the, to the larger scale retrospectives. I'll ask you a question as well. I was just wondering about, um, if you take it up to the C-suite level and you have a bigger retrospective, is it not the case that you need to do a bit more prep on costs of options, that sort of thing, if you want action? You know, I mean, I've I never think, done it, so I don't know. So. Yeah, I've only I've only had the pleasure of doing a few of them, and I love them when you can get the right people in the room. Um, I think it's kind of fascinating to have that many levels of the organization all together and having this conversation around improvement. I mean, I think this kind of goes back to what's in your control and out of your control. But when it when it spans the whole part of the organization, I think you've got a lot more people who have control over driving change in the room 
to help say what's possible or not, you know, kind of if you've got C-suite and you've got executive leadership present for a retrospective, I think they can really help participate in saying like, this is the direction we want to go as a business or um, even, even from a, like you said, a funding or risk perspective around what things are important for them to invest in or invest in addressing. What's the best practice to make things actionable in a higher level retrospective? So when I, when I remember retrospectives that we've done for clients on like a department level with 50 people, including the department leads and stuff like that, uh, it creates a lot, of lo a lot of noise. It takes a lot of time. So it's really a complex scenario. Um, and the good thing about team retrospective is you have a small group of people and it's pretty actionable. Uh, if you have 50 people in the room, it's a different story. So what's your best practice for that? Yeah, I mean, I think you you hit the nail on the head there with keeping it small, right? Keeping the, the improvement small, making sure they've got an owner and making sure they've got a measure of success and then making them visible. So having a way of creating cards on a, you know, in JIRA, so you can pull those items into your sprint. Like a lot of, I think that's where a lot of stuff falls flat, right? We identify these improvements, but um, they don't get prioritized as work. And in some cases, there's a lot of work to be done there. So it's putting our same agile practices in place around these improvements of how do we take something and maybe break it down into something that's smaller and actionable and can be um, consumed and prioritized across multiple different teams. Um, and then tracked just like we would track anything else, right? 